Well, it's our privilege today to speak to Lord Robert Edmiston. Thank you very much for giving us your time. And, and the topic of our discussion is lessons learned as a businessman, a politician, and a philanthropist. And you're eminently well suited to be talking about these things. You've been a businessman, you've worked in property, motor, and finance sectors. You've at times employed over a thousand staff. You've been a politician, member of the British House of Lords, from which I think you've just retired a couple of years ago. So you've heard and taken part in a lot of different political debates on a whole lot of issues. And then with your wife, Tracy, you've set up a, a charity called CV, which is working in over 20 countries worldwide, helping to resource Christian work and uh, particularly in the areas of education, uh, discipleship, and evangelism. So what we're going to try and do in this next half hour is to cover all three of those issues and, and pick up some of the lessons that, that you've learned that I hope will be of, of benefit to people working in whatever field. So perhaps we can start with the businessman side, and you've worked in the property, the motor, and the finance sectors at, at varying stages. What biblical principles have you found as a, as a Christian have been most useful to you working in the business world, but particularly in areas of management? Well, um, first of all, I should say, being a Christian, I was a Christian at the age of 17, and okay. I wanted to be a missionary, yeah. uh, but that never worked out. And there was a prophetic word I received when I was young, and it turned out that being in business actually has helped that to happen. Um, I think one of my most important principles is keeping your word. And I, I think sometimes it's difficult to do that because circumstances change. So I'm very cautious about giving my word, mm. uh, but when I do, I keep it. Mm. And I think that's a, a fundamental pr principle in business. People need to tr be able to trust you. Um, and sometimes it's not profitable in the short term because you may want to change, things may have changed. But if you've given your word, you should keep it but in the long term it proves to be uh, the right way to go. Uh, scripture is full of uh, uh, suggestions, particularly the book of Proverbs. For instance, uh, there's one that says, a soft answer turns away anger. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're in customer relations, you really need to know about that. Uh, but there are other scriptures which challenge us, the one uh, where it says, to whom much is given, much is expected. And so I, I never viewed this as totally mine. This is something God's given me. By the way, at school I flunked. I, mm -hmm. I was held down one year for paying truant mm -hmm. for six months. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have to say, I wasn't that bright. Uh, I didn't leave school with loads of qualifications. So uh, I believe that God is, uh, gives us the power to create wealth. And if we rely on him, then he can direct our path. Uh, Solomon asked for wisdom, and because he asked for wisdom, God said, I'll also give you wealth. Um, when I was 17 and first became a Christian, on two occasions, God sort of spoke to me and said, empty your pockets in the offering, which I did. And I was in uh, East Ham, and I had to walk like seven miles home to Elm Park in the dark. Mm -hmm. And I did it twice, and I believe that was God just testing my attitude towards money, because... I don't want to be too sticky fingers about it and mm. keep it all for myself. Mm. In fact, it becomes a pointless exercise after a while. We go. Well, why did you feel you should have responded on those two particular occasions? Um, well, did when you, God or, tells you to do something, yeah. you should respond. Yeah. Um, he's told me to do things in the past, and mostly I've responded. But occasionally I haven't, and I felt really bad because I felt I let God down. Mm. But on those two occasions, as a young Christian, I did. And uh, I think I, I have the rewards of it today. Uh, but as soon as I got, gained control of my company, which is in 1988, mm. that's and when what, I set what, up what a charity. What company was, was that? Was the oh, first okay. one you were into? Because you started out as a bank clerk, didn't you? Before you got into these other industries. So yeah, what was your I, first company? I was a bank clerk to start mm. with. And then uh, my, I got married when I was 20. And my mm. son arrived when I was 22. Mm -hmm. 60% of the household income was my wife's salary, so mm. that went. Mm. And so necessity is a great motivator. Mm. And so I started studying to be an accountant, mm. and I eventually qualified as an accountant, worked for Ford Motor Company, and then mm. for Chrysler, and then eventually Jensen Motors. And uh, I jo joined them during uh, the time of the 
uh, oil crisis in 73. And within six months, we were in bankruptcy. And I was mm. the financial controller. Mm. So it didn't look at all good. Okay. Um, so out of that catastrophe, I set up the parts and service company to supply parts for the Jensen owners because we were no longer making the cars. They had 7.2 litre engines. And when you were rationed to two gallons of oil, uh, of gas, you know, uh, you weren't going very far on that. So the company went broke. Um, but out of that came the company I have today. Mm. And it grew and grew from that from that point. Now, it's uh, interesting, you've already, you've referred to Solomon, the book of Proverbs, you've talked about wisdom. W what role should biblical wisdom play in, in matters of business? Have, have, you, have you found it's been applicable across a wide area? I think, as Christians, it should play a role in every aspect of our lives. Uh, you see, we give our time for, to make money. So what we do with our money is also what we're doing with our life because we're giving our life for that. And therefore, I think every aspect of our life, I was once heard it preached, it's not your money, it's God's money. It's not your business, it's God's business. Mm -hmm. And occasionally I've turned that back on God when there's a problem. I said, well, then it's not my problem, God, it's your problem. What are you going to do about the problem we're currently facing? And that's happened on a couple of occasions. Mm -hmm. How can a business person practice wisdom? I think you have to look at the word. You know, there's the wisdom of ages in the Bible. Jesus told us a kind of wisdom which is contrary to human nature, like turn the other cheek, love your enemies. These things, Christianity isn't difficult. It's impossible. Um, without the Holy Spirit and without accepting Christ, you cannot live a Christian life because what he asks you to do in the natural is not possible. Uh, but then once we become spiritually alive, then there's this thing where God is speaking to us all the time. So I can't tell you whether some of my business decisions were spiritually inspired or naturally inspired, because we have three voices, don't we? Human voice, a voice of the spirit, and a voice of the enemy. And mm. um, we have to discern between which one is which. And Occasionally, I may have got it wrong, but by and large, you know, it seems to have worked. And as I say, I don't think I was that bright, but uh, God helped, you know, direct our path. Now you've been very much working in the world as opposed to in the institutional church, in, in politics and in business and in your philanthropic work as well. And you will have worked with lots and lots of uh, non-Christians. You will have managed non-Christians, you would have been managed by them, you'll be working alongside them. What lessons have you learnt about how best to build good relationships with non-Christians and to communicate something of, of the Lord with them? I suppose I can best say it to my, as I instructed my son when he started taking over the business, I said, this is your congregation. These employees are your congregation. This is your mission field mm. and you've got to treat them as you would expect to be treated, treat them with care and concern. Uh, and obviously you've got to be straight with them. Uh, and sometimes you have to deal with hard issues like you have to make people redundant from time to time when economic circumstances arise. And you have to show your Christianity in how you do it and, and, and the way in which you do it rather than not taking the tough decisions. But uh, I found that just treating people like normal human beings. In many cases, my employees would be my friends. Mm. Um, so um, we occasionally go on social uh, events together. Uh, I've taken the whole company away to Spain one time when we had a good year. When we have a good year, I give them a decent bonus. Mm. If we have a bad year, we all suffer together. Mm. So uh, I just involve them. People like to be involved in, in uh, insiders in the running of a business. I guess you will have had Christian employees as, as well over the years. What, what have you learnt about other Christians through, through working with them in these sectors? When you've got a good Christian, you've got a great employee. But sometimes Christians have another agenda. And they may not always be as good employees as sometimes non-Christians. I know this is not a very popular thing to say. But the reality is the non-Christian has only one thing in his mind, that's his career, his job, and mm -hmm. his family, etc. Yeah. The Christian has a higher calling, which is to God, and sometimes that comes into conflict 
with their place of work. Like you might want them to do something. And they say, oh, well, I've got to do this uh, uh, and I've got to go to church and so on. And sometimes that can be a, a source of conflict. And I think we need to recognize that our workplace is also a place of calling and we should be examples in the workplace and we should be the best employees. We should be the hardest working, the most honest. And, and when they are like that, they're fantastic employees, but it isn't always so, I'm afraid. Mm. I guess Christians are under a lot more pressure now in the workplace because we're living in a society that's perhaps more hostile to Christian faith and values than it was, uh, where there's, there are more, there's more influence of secularism in the corridors of power like parliament and the judiciary and universities and institutions, art, media, entertainment. Uh, and there's a real challenge, isn't there, to be in the world but, but not of the world. What, what advice would you be giving to Christians working in the in the workplace, secular workplace, as someone who's had to manage them? Actually, I'm not sure it is harder now. I, I have a feeling it's actually somewhat easier, but maybe it's because I've got older and people now look at me as a successful businessman and therefore they find it harder to argue with my point of view. Okay. But when I was young, when I was a bank clerk, uh, you know, they tended to discard my views but nevertheless, I would still witness. So I'm not sure it is uh, harder. The, the problem I think now is um, that uh, it can be just another one of those things that people do. Oh, well, you go to church on a Sunday and the relevance of Jesus and his message and his relevance to their life is just sort of um, like something you do at home. It's just like you're mem a member of a golf club. Whereas before, uh, when I was younger, we would see it as very much a real challenge to you that your life had to change. And I think uh, our level of Bible knowledge, younger people today, is probably a little more superficial than it was, uh, than it was when I was young. You spent a lot of time in the world of politics, uh, which can be pretty tough, and you're very much in the limelight. There are, what advice would you give to Christians going into politics? Should Christians go into politics, first of all? And, and if they do, what, what advice would you give them as, as to being a good witness in, in that very public place? Well, number one, I think they should go into politics younger than I did. I was mm -hmm. 65, and that's a little too old, frankly, okay. because you really have to build relationships and, uh, and people who are going to support your point of view. But I would encourage them to do so. I would encourage them not to be corrupted too much in terms of it, it can easily happen that uh, uh, you end up compromising your views and positions. Now, I know uh, some Christian politicians get challenged on all sorts of things. Yeah. It's amazing. They don't necessarily challenge a Muslim on, on the same issue, yeah. but they'll challenge a Christian. And I think you need to have your answers for that, and you need to have thought through your position. The, the Bible tells us we have to have a reason for our belief. Now... Mm. Politics involves a lot of consensus, um, and I found that a little difficult from a business point of view because I came, I used to look at my business, make a decision, what was best for me, my customers, my employees, that's what we'd do, mm. and we'd do it tomorrow. Mm. Mm. In, in politics, you discuss it uh, in one house and then the other house and back and forth, and by the time you end up doing it, it's something different than what you originally started out with. But I understand that's very necessary because I only had to worry about my business. But in politics, you have to worry about the young, the old, the rich, the poor, the north, the south. Uh, and every color and shade of opinion has to be taken in. Uh, I found that a little frustrating, frankly. But nevertheless, I do see it's very necessary. Um, and I think what we have is probably the best you can have. And it's certainly a lot better than many of the other systems that operate where there are dictators. So. Um, I think our, our politics, ultimately we get to the right sort of conclusion, but they tend to be compromises. And one bill we discussed for 17 days, that I find quite difficult, because I would discuss it for 17 minutes, you know. What, what, bill, what bill was that? Oh, well, that was actually to do with, um, the, uh, we were going to have a referendum on whether we change the voting system when the Liberals okay. and, the, uh, and the Conservatives were working together in, in Parliament. Now, you retired from the House of Lords in 2015 to concentrate much more on your charitable philanthropic work. 
and I believe together with, with Tracy, your wife, you set up a charity back in 1988, which is, which is still running and which you're very much involved in. It's working in over 20 countries. Can you tell us a bit, what, a bit about what CV actually does and what, what your priorities and goals are at the moment? Well, I set up the charity in 1988. Actually, my wife was employed to do that. Um, and that was when I first gained 100% control of the business because before then I couldn't have given away my partner's money. Mm. But so in 88 we got control and the scripture is clear, to whom much is given, much is expected. Okay. Mm. So we had a few main guidelines. We didn't want to create um, dependency. We didn't want to uh, do something if it was going to happen already. Uh, we, we wanted to use new technologies and do things that the average local church couldn't do because we had a big resource. We had to do big things. Um, so there's two basic projects we've got. One is called Touch a Billion which is a media-related thing. At the moment, we're focusing on uh, internet and social media mm -hmm. uh, as a means of producing lots of films that people can share with their friends about stories about people who were depressed, mm -hmm. suicidal, or footballers, and out of interests or needs. We can create videos that they can share that then are used as a vehicle to lead them to the Lord. Mm -hmm. The other one is Impact a Nation, and that's where we sponsor individual church planters and at the moment we're sponsoring around 800 in different parts of the world in Myanmar, in Venezuela, in the eastern part of Ukraine, in Indonesia. So those are the two main things. They're all about evangelism though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so evangelism has been very much the main focus for you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Indeed. And, um, and, and uh, could, uh, some stories you can tell us about things that you've seen happen as a result of this work that have been really encouraging. Well, at the moment we're receiving like on our uh, touch a billion, like 30,000 people every day are coming and visiting our sites. We're running um, in South Africa uh, uh, a Facebook Live program uh, where we're just talking about prayer. Mm -hmm. 50,000 to 60,000 people a week are coming uh, uh, to, to receive prayer. Mm -hmm. And that opens a conversation because if you want to receive prayer, you recognize that there's a God. Otherwise, what's the point of being prayed for? Mm -hmm. And that opens up conversations, particularly when their prayers get answered. Mm -hmm. So that's another exciting thing. There was a wonderful project we did with the Vietnamese refugees many, many years ago in Hong Kong, where we managed to distribute Christian literature there. And uh, there were about 2,000 people who ended up getting baptized in oil drums in the, in the camps by being dunked like this, it was wonderful. Uh, we had a radio station in Zambia. We currently have um, 550 FM stations in Latin America mm -hmm. that take and rebroadcast our Spanish programming mm -hmm. that's made in Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's wonderful when you hear stories about people who were gonna commit suicide mm -hmm. and something we did stop them. People's lives who have changed and been touched and I get reports of this from time to time. And that's the thing that's the real payoff for me. And it really keeps you going. I oh, bet. it does. It's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. A lot of the people watching this, this video will be in positions of leadership in Christian NGOs, charitable organizations. What, what sort of advice would you give from your own experience to people leading charities today about the principles that they should be applying? I think you should be focused, keep focused on what, what it is that you've been called to do. There are so many distractions and so many good ideas which aren't necessarily God ideas. Mm. I'll give you one little dream I had. I was called to go to a hospital and see the person in the end bed. Mm -hmm. I got into the hospital and in the first bed somebody said, oh, Bob, could you help me with this? Then the next bed somebody was said, could I just have a glass of water? And one by one, I was just distracted, doing good things. Mm. But when I got to the end bed, the person had just died. Mm. And so good is the enemy of great. Mm. And uh, sometimes we settle on our secondary objective and we miss our first. And so I would just counsel them, keep their first. The main thing is keep the main thing the main thing all the mm. time. That would be my advice. And how have you personally done that? Can you give us some examples of, of how you've maintained your focus and in the charity because your work does seem to be very focused with very clear priority. Because I get hundreds of requests for all sorts of different things. 
and I have to, I can't answer them all, and particularly you can't monitor them all. And the charity commissioner does uh, have a high standard that we monitor where the, where the money's being spent because we're getting tax relief on on donating this money, so they want to know that it's being used responsibly. And we have to very often say we have a standard charity regret letter. Say, well, sorry, we can't. And so we only focus on things that are going to do massive evangelism. Uh, or, uh, like Reinhard Bonnke, we have sponsored him, mm. but he's holding mass evangelism rallies and seeing eight million decisions a year. Mm. So people like that who are in accord with our general direction, mm. we work with them. Mm. Okay. What, uh, what, what tools or resources have helped you over the years to remain faithful to the Lord in all these different spheres in which you've been working? When I was younger, they, they had this idea that everything had to go through the local church. With the resource I had, we would totally be 99.9% .9 of the income, and that would never have worked because it would have been my church, not our church. And uh, so I looked to our local church as my local spiritual covering. Mm. But I don't look to them as the covering for the ministry, and that is all the senior people within the ministry and one or two external uh, advisors. I look to them for the covering of the ministry, but uh, to my local pastor and local church for my personal covering. So um, I don't know if I've answered your question there, but uh, that, that's how I cover uh, the ministry as separate from my personal life. How do you remain accountable yourself? Because there must be lots of temptations and, and also uh, competing demands. The coming, you've, you've, you've been very busy during your life with responsibilities? Well, I can't say I've been perfect. Uh, in fact, I haven't. Uh, and I failed in a number of areas. And I don't like to profess to uh, any level of, because it means for other people you can't aspire to that. And I think the wonderful thing is the Bible tells us the story of David, a man after God's own heart, yet he committed adultery and murder. Mm. And, and I have feet of clay, just mm. like everybody else. Mm. And whatever God's done for me, uh, he can do for others. Uh, so I would want them to believe they can aspire to greater things. I was a bank clerk. I now have a huge bank balance. And I've uh, uh, got a charity which we've donated nearly 300 million pounds to. Mm -hmm. And that could never have been possible for a school dropout <laughs> and a bank clerk uh, unless God had been in it. So I have to give him the glory. I always say what I had, what I have, was here before, somebody had it before me, someone will have it after me. Mm. I'm just a steward now. Mm. Can you just talk a bit more about the whole biblical idea of stewardship and, and what you've, you've learned? Because you've been talking about it being God's money and, and not yours, but, that, but clearly you've, you've played a really active role in deciding before God how you, you spend it. So how, how do you see that? Well, I think if I've been given it, I have the responsibility to use it properly. Mm. Uh, and so there's a stewardship responsibility there. Um, I, I don't want to just uh, willy-nilly give it away to thing because uh, also I should say money in itself will not achieve anything because the Bible says unless the Lord build a house, they labor in vain mm. that build it. So I could just waste all this money. So I seek God's direction and how we spend it. Um, and uh, I think we just have to have that attitude of heart that uh, we are servants of God and everything we have is his. It's, it's, you know, the New Testament, it's not just about the 10% tithe, that's the Old Testament. The New Testament, they gave everything. Mm -hmm. And really, I have to take the view that everything I have is God's. Mm -hmm. And if he were to ask me to give it all away, and I hope he doesn't, um, not at least until <laughs> I'd, But if he were, I'd have to... I'd have to ha put a fleece out first to know it was right, but then I would, I would have to feel that it's God's, it's yes. up to him. You know, my very life is his. You know, I, I didn't have life without God giving it to me. So how can I withhold that which is already his? Yes. Well, the Lord says, given it will be given to you, uh, doesn't he? And, and he promises us that we'll always have enough, both for our own need, needs in order to supply the needs of others. Mm -hmm. But I think there's, there's a massive challenge for the church in the West here, isn't there? Because there, there are perhaps many 
Christian believers who do have a lot of resources or have been blessed with finances and, and influence. Now, how would you, what would your encouragement be to, for, on the basis of your own experience and what you've seen of God's provision and blessing, what, what would you say to people who have been blessed with financial resources in the churches about the good that they could achieve and how could they go about uh, following in, the, in these paths? I'm going to give a couple of comments. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? What he, God was actually saying was all the treasures of the world are not worth one soul. God is not impressed with treasure. He made it all. Mm. You know, streets are paved of gold in heaven. You know, so wh why should he be impressed with it? He that wins souls is wise. Mm. We can't take our money with us, but we can send the souls ahead. Mm. Do you know, mm. so that's one mm. thing. But one of the things that happens to wealthy people is they get lots of requests mm. and, and they get inundated with them. And mm. then sometimes they give money to things and they find it's been abused. Okay. That can be a real problem mm. and cause them to stop. Okay. The thing that I've had to remind myself of time after time when we've had such issues, scripture says, grow not weary in well-doing. Mm. And the reason it says grow not weary in well-doing is because they must have been. And they probably were getting weary and well-doing because they had the same problems we have. Mm -hmm. And we have to just exercise stewardship to make sure we give our money properly and, and take all the proper uh, checks and balances. Mm -hmm. But then at a certain point when you hand it over, you have to accept it's their responsibility to answer for God. And if they abuse it, we shouldn't stop us doing it. Mm -hmm. But they have to answer for that because they're his servants just the same as we are. So that's a really important lesson that wealthy people need to understand. Once you've given it, it's no longer your responsibility. Mm -hmm. And if it is abused, okay, it's sad. Um, uh, but don't stop doing it. And, and you must have, I guess, with managing you know, these, these big amounts to give to a whole lot of different charities, there must have been people you've supported when you thought, well, maybe that wasn't the best use of it. How, how do you deal with that and move on from that and learn from that? Uh, and, I, I uh, say, it, if you get kicked by the same donkey twice, who's the donkey? So you don't go there a second time. Okay. So, and you should learn. We should be learners uh, and, you know, they should be stepping stones, not stumbling blocks. Mm -hmm. And so if that happens, okay, I'm not going to make that same mistake twice. Uh, and I will learn from it and improve my checks and balances. And some of the things mean we've actually done the project ourselves rather than giving it to a third party. So, uh, but I can't say it all hit the mark. You know, probably 20% of it uh, has gone elsewhere. Mm. And we have had situations where people have defrauded uh, the charity. Mm -hmm. uh, we gave them money to distribute to some organizations and they pocketed it. Um, but we're getting better and better at uh, checking that actually things happen. You have to have those checks and balances. They say people won't do what they're expected to do. They'll do what they're inspected to do. One last thing is um, I think we have to understand some cultures have no immunity to money like the Incas all died from the common cold because mm. they had no immunity. Mm. If you put a lot of money in the hands of somebody who's never been used to it, mm. you're causing them to fall. Mm. And so actually we should be really careful about that. We should not create a temptation which causes our brother to fall. Mm. So just release it in dribs and drabs, yes. in, in, in amounts that they can handle without corrupting them. And then hopefully they'll learn how to handle a little and as the proverb says, be, or as the parable says, those who are faithful in a little will be faithful in much. And that's a, another principle. We always do something small with somebody first. Mm. If they then prove to be faithful, then we will grow yes. it over time. Yes. yes. You've had a, a long life, a very varied life. You're still looking in pretty good health. And how, how do you, just finally, how do you look to the future and what you like to achieve before either the Lord calls you home or, or he returns for you? I read something recently which said your 60s and 70s can be even more productive than the fruit because you've got wisdom, mm. perhaps not the same strength and energy. Um, very much the reason I retired from the laws, I thought, what do I want to do with the next 10 years of my mm. life? Mm. 
and I didn't really want to spend it in debate. I wanted to spend it doing something. Okay. Uh, and our charity was already doing things, but mm. I just wanted to commit more time to that. My son then was running the business, so it was perfect. Um, and I guess I want to see, as a businessman, you always want more. Mm. If you receive a char target one year, you, what, what are we going to do mm. next year? So similarly, in the charity, I was saying, well, okay, we've done this much this year. What can we do more? Mm. And I'm sure I'll always be saying, what can we do more? How can we do it better? How can we do it quick? That's just my mentality, and I think it's right. We should be, you know, the scripture talks about those that uh, 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 there's tenfold, thirtyfold, and a hundredfold. Yes, yes. I've said, I want to be a hundredfold. Yeah. I like round numbers. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, how do we just keep pushing the boundaries? Um, I'm not uh, able to understand all this new technology, but I understand what it can do. Mm. And therefore, I've got people who do understand the technology, and, and we're trying to push the boundaries with that all the time to see if we can't find new ways in which we can reach people. Jesus went to where the people are, and right now they're watching mobile phones mm. 10 times an hour. Mm. Uh, and so we want to be there. Yeah. And uh, that's the way of reaching the young generation. Yeah. So you're seeing more and more opportunities as, as long as the, the Lord strengthens you to do it. Lord Emerson, thank you very much for your time. It's been a real blessing. And may the Lord continue to bless your philanthropy and your service and your marriage uh, together and uh, in all your responsibilities. Thank you very much.